So welcome to another episode of The Zach Holly Show. Today, I have the honor of being with Dr. Amy McKenzie. So let's talk a little bit about her. So Amy McKenzie, MD, grew up in Los Angeles, but fled the scene in 1994 after college in rural New York to live and work in Japan for three years. She decided to pursue medicine at that time and headed back to the States to finish up pre-med work while working for the Japanese consulate in Los Angeles. That's so cool. She then moved to Philadelphia in 2000 to work and apply to med school, ultimately enrolling at MCP Hahnemann, which is now Drexel. After a year as a part-time faculty at the med school, she went on to three years of IM residency at Temple and subsequently worked as a hospitalist at the Fox Chase Cancer Center for a year between residency and fellowship. She completed her Hemong Fellowship at Jefferson in 2013 and then became the first oncologist to do a geriatrics fellowship at Jefferson. She has four board certifications, internal medicine, hematology, oncology, and geriatrics. She's an associate professor and a fellow of the American College of Physicians, actively participates in an older adults task force with ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology, and sits on the board of the newly formed American Academy of Geriatric Oncology. Welcome to the show, Amy. Thank you so much for coming. It's my pleasure. So the way I like to start off with is read a few stats around the specialty, and then we'll go into the first question. Sounds good. So stats. So this is around oncology, not specifically hematology, oncology. But the burnout rate is 35% compared to the overall burnout rate of 36% average as of 2023. As for happiness, the oncology happiness score was 51% compared to the 58% score overall. In regards to salary, the average salary of physicians overall in America was 339K, while the median heme onc salary was 342,361. Hours overall, the average physician in America works 51 hours a week, while 52 hours a week is worked by heme onc doctors. And these are big averages. Mm-hmm. Every, nothing crazy to you there? No, I mean, I think we probably work more than 52, 52 hours. What do you, th- a week. What do you think yeah, the yeah. number is? Probably closer to 60 or 65. It depends. Yeah, it depends. There's a, there's a, there are a lot of ways to specialize in hemonc. Yeah. So if you, you know. And tell me, what is hematology oncology? Yeah. Um, interestingly, the reason why people who practice hemonc do heme and onc yeah. is because the initial chemo, the initial cancers that were treated by chemotherapy were the leukemias and lymphomas. Uh, back in probably the 1960s. So you had a group of hematologists who treated the hematologic malignancies and general or benign heme, as you might hear it called. Oncology was much more of a surgical specialty. So you cut it out and that was it. You know, there wasn't a lot of chemotherapy for solid tumors. As chemotherapy made its way from the heme malignancies to the solid tumor world, then you started to see this combination of hematology and oncology. So you can study hematology and oncology and go on to become a general hematologist, a leukemia doctor, a solid tumor physician. You can specialize in transplant um, or you can do general oncology with some hematology, which is what I do with a focus in geriatrics. Mm. So do you, so you do three years of internal medicine residency first, right? Yeah. And then do you go into hemong? Because can you do onc and then make it hemong? How does how exactly can you get there? Most special most fellowships. Yeah. Are heme and onc together? Got it. And there are some where you can just do the onc, but most people don't just do hematology. Yeah. It's he, general hematology is very academic. Yeah. So if you really want to pursue hematology as a specialty, you're going to be at an academic center and you're going to be doing thrombosis and probably hemophilia and sickle cell anemia, all of that. Yeah. Um, if you practice hematology in the community with oncology, it's going to be a lot of iron deficiency anemia, high platelets, blood clots, et cetera. Sometimes sort of working up, you know, high platelets, low platelets, et cetera. Uh, So most of the time people do a combined fellowship and then go on to specialize in either general oncology with some heme or they'll focus on doing some kind of solid tumor like thoracic oncology for, you know, lung cancer or breast cancer is very common. Or then you have people who go on to treat leukemia and lymphoma. And even in that realm, you can specialize again to do just lymphoma or transplant. So there are a lot of ways that you can 
really subspecialize mm-hmm. after you do three years of hematology and oncology. Wow, wow. I appreciated all of the hematology training that I got in my fellowship. It was very rigorous, but yeah. it helped me to be able to see a lot, a wide variety of patients. Yeah. And hematology is really useful, I think, for a lot of specialties. So I think that that, that part of the training uh, is really helpful, especially if you decide to just pursue oncology. There's a lot of heme in onc. No, of course. I'm just remembering, I'm trying to remember my, my medical school classes and stuff like that. But I know, for example, patients with cancer are more likely to clot, for example, right? Mm-hmm. Usually. That's exact, yeah, that's right. So this is an interesting point because this is something, before I came into medical school, I thought there's only one cancer doctor. You, there's only, you know what I mean? You go to med school to be a cancer doctor, and then you treat every cancer in the brain, in the lungs, in the blood, in the heart, and everywhere. But really, there's many different types of cancer doctor, right? If you have a solid tumor in your lung or something like that, you might see one doctor versus if you have a, a, a cancer in your blood, for example, leukemia or something like that, you'll see a, a different doctor, correct? It depends. Okay. Um, so I treat lung cancer, yeah. colon cancer, breast cancer, um, some chronic leukemias. Mm-hmm. I don't treat acute leukemia. Okay. Um, so if you are a general oncologist, yep. then yeah, you can treat a lot of different things. There, We all sort of subspecialize even in the community, mm-hmm. meaning I don't usually treat melanoma or thyroid cancer or brain tumors. And some people came may, may have come from fellowships where they focused in one thing or another. So it's some of it is based upon the need that is in the practice you go to. And yep. some of it is based upon, you know, what you enjoy. I enjoy geriatrics, so I see everything. Yeah. I see a lot of different cancers so that I can treat a lot of older people. Yeah. Let's talk about your journey. So how did you go to Chemonc? And then why do you have these other two board certifications? I loved blood in medical school. Got it. I thought blood was so fascinating, so cool. It's beautiful. It's multifunctional. Yeah. I mean, blood is just very cool. Um, so I always liked that in med school. It took me time to figure out even if I wanted to do internal medicine. I really liked surgery. I do not like getting up early in the morning. Yeah. So, and I had a habit of passing out. So that made- At the sight of blood? Because <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that's um, it. <laughs> not so much at the sight of blood, yes. but at the idea of human suffering. Yes, okay. Well, it just, I'm- I would get vagal. But yeah. at any rate, so surgery was was great, you know, won awards. No, I'm not going to do surgery. Yeah. So internal medicine. And I I had an interest. I mean, when I was an intern, I worked together with an oncologist at Fox Chase, which is, you know, close um, close by, right? So there's Temple, Jefferson Penn, they're all close by. And she said, oh, somebody asked me to write a paper on mTOR inhibitors. Can you do it? I was like, yeah. I had no idea what an mTOR inhibitor was. <laughs> I had no idea, but I said yes. And I remember being up, you know, one of the rotations in residency is night float. So you have, I don't know, I can't remember if it was three weeks or four weeks where you work at night and you sleep during the day. And if it's quiet, you know, you have time to do stuff. So I was working on this paper and it, it went well. And I thought it was pretty interesting. Those drugs uh, one of which is sirolimus, which is you know an anti-rejection drug. I mean, those drugs have come a long way in the cancer world, but this was a while ago and it was new. So I did that and I got more and more interested in oncology. I still wasn't quite certain that's what I wanted to do. Most of the decisions that I've made have taken a while to come to. So it's a slow burn. It wasn't an epiphany moment or anything like that. Not so much. Um, I do remember that when I was a third year, which is a little late in the game, Mm -hmm. um, but at that time, there wasn't as much of a push to, like, you have to know right away. And I remember that I was admitting a patient. It had to have been two or three in the morning. And this guy had had a biopsy of a lump behind his leg. And it was a synovial sarcoma. And I'm up at 2.30 in the morning looking this up. I'm like, wow, this is really cool. I thought, oh, okay. I think this is probably what I want to do. And I remember it really clearly. 
I think this is what I want to do. You think this is what you want to do? Why was it? Was it? Like, did you like the description of it? Was it something interesting about the pathology of the disease? What? what? Um, How did you know? Yes, because I want things. that moment. I think I everyone know. wants well, that you, moment. Well, I think that sometimes people get that moment, and sometimes it's many moments. Yeah. Right. That that come together. I remember thinking, wow, this is really interesting pathology and what are we going to do to treat it? And what's the treatment for this? And, uh, you know, cancer is fascinating. It's evil and fascinating. Um, and it is really varied. You know, I mean, I always tell my patients, cancer describes many diseases. And so at that point when I thought, okay, I like this. I think this is interesting. I think it was more the fact that at 2.30 in the morning, I found something interesting. True. Right? Um, I like to sleep. Yeah. So if I can find something that really catches my interest, I, I, took, I listened to that. Yeah. And at the time, my husband was in his critical care fellowship, maybe, his neurocritical care fellowship. Um, and he wanted to go into interventional neuroradiology. And I remember we were sitting outside at a cafe in Philly. And he said, I want to pursue this. And I said, yeah, I think I want to pursue Hemonk. Wow. And I remember it. I remember it was wearing. Yeah. Because it was that moment that I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to pursue this. Wow. And um, yeah, and then, and then, you know, had to figure out, okay, how do we make this work, the two of us? That's yeah. a different story It's a whole other thing. Mm-hmm. That's so I just want to take a little bit of a step back because you yeah. also had an interesting path to medical school. You didn't go the traditional path, which I think is becoming more of the norm today, but you had an even less traditional <laughs> path by going to Japan for three right. years. Can you just tell me a little bit about the decision to go from kind of doing other things to medicine is what I'm going to do? Yeah. Uh, I was a neuroscience major in college. Yeah. So I was interested in science. I ended up going to Japan, and I guess <clears throat> it's not a secret if I say it here, but I, I had nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> and my sister had a friend who had gone to Japan and taught English there, and she said, oh, this is great. You should do this. You should really do this. So I go and I get the application for the um, Japanese education and tre- teaching program. It's called the JET program. Mm. A lot of people have done it. Go and get the application. My roommate fills it out. Uh, so, okay. Then I was, I stayed at school during spring break of my senior year and I found this little ad in the newspaper and it said, teach English in Japan. And it was really about that big, you know, it's very small. And I looked into that and I applied and I went to New York to interview and I got the job and I went to Tokyo. It's crazy. Um, it was crazy. Yeah. And, and it was great because I, you know, developed my independence Mm -hmm. I really liked to travel. I did a lot of traveling at that time, which I, which I can't do as easily now because of time. Of course. Right? Um, when you're young and you have time, you don't have the money, right? When you're older and you have the money, you don't always have the time. Fortunately, when you're young, you can travel cheaply and it doesn't bother you. <laughs> um, so I, I spent this time in Japan and I um, was dating somebody who was a lifeguard in Japan. We were in a restaurant and all of a sudden, bang, heard a noise. Some girl had passed out right on the table and that was the sound of her head hitting the table. And in Japan, those kinds of things make people uncomfortable. You know, people don't go rushing over. Oh my gosh, everyone was sort of, what do we do, you know? Well, because he was a lifeguard, you know, he went over and he said, you know, what's going on? Are you okay? Did you eat? Did you drink? And again, I thought, oh, I think this is what I want to do. You know, I remember it really clearly. I thought, this is really something to be able to come to someone's aid and potentially help them. Yeah. With the, at the risk of sounding, you know, trite. Oh, I want to help people. I mean, that, you have to want to help people if you become a physician. But this, I really felt like, wow, here's somebody, something happened, no one knows what's going on, and we're going to come over and try to figure it out and try to make her better. Yeah, yeah. She was just dehydrated. It was the middle of summer. Wow. So at that point, I'd been in Japan probably maybe two years, maybe a little longer, 
And I had taken a lot of the prereqs in college, but I knew I had a lot to, I had to, I wanted to retake organic chemistry and I wanted to take physics, et cetera. So I remember talking to my dad. I said, yeah, I think, I think I'm going to pursue this. I think I'm going to pursue medicine, but I've got to come home to do it. So I took maybe another eight months, kind of wrapped things up in Japan, went back to Los Angeles, of course had to get a job. So I worked at the Japanese consulate as one of the receptionists. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. I mean, I'm not fluent in Japanese, but I could say enough yeah. to be able to understand people and transfer people. And, yeah. you know, I mean, I was, I was okay. And they let me study. So I would be, you know, answering phones and doing work, but also studying. It was, for yeah, the MCAT was really and things ideal. like that? For the MCAT. For, for more my, of classes. For the classes, yeah. I took like physics, genetics, um, organic chemistry, yeah. you know. And it was a little bit at a time. Yeah. Like one day a week. And it's a little bit daunting though, right? To, to switch careers and have to take all these courses and put all this new time and effort. But you knew so much that this is what I want to do that you're just like, I'm just going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And it didn't, it didn't feel like I'd had a career. Being in Japan was not a career. Yeah, okay. Uh, it was something that I did that, and, and, and when I think about it in hindsight, you know, it was my gap time or it was yeah. the time that I had to figure out. In the moment, I didn't think to myself, I've got to figure out what I want to do. I was just doing it. Yeah. And fortunately, I came to the decision. Yeah. Um, and so I was able to have some direction. Yeah. So I, I, worked at the Japanese consulate, I took the MCAT, I did all of that. And then uh, I started dating somebody who is now my husband of 20 years. And he was in school at MCP Hahnemann. So I said, all right, well, I might- How'd you meet a guy from NC, well, you're in Los Angeles, right? Yeah, he was working at UCLA in a lab. Uh, okay, got so it, he got did it. the same thing, he took yeah. eight years off. Wow. Um, my path is way cooler. Than yeah, his, but, <laughs> but he's super smart. That was like, academic research. No man, that. he was working on neurodegenerative diseases and like really, really cool. Um, so he was living here in Philly, and I said, you know, I'm just applying to med school. I could do that anywhere. I might as well move. And I did, and I got a job at the Moss Research Rehab Institute, and I taught MCAT classes with Kaplan and you know, cobbled it together and then then got into med school. And at that time, it was a little bit harder for older students to get in. It was not as common. And they just- How old are you, if you don't mind me asking, when no, you joined med school? I was 29. 29. Um, and at MCP Hahnemann, there yeah. were a lot of older students. Really? Yeah. It seems more normal. That's why I'm saying, and it seems to be shifting more and more. I think the average age the other day, I looked at it, of the matriculating med student was like 25 or 26, which is crazy when you think, oh, I thought it was you go 24 years undergrad, then straight through, but it's, yeah. just, not, it's just not the way it is. Well, 20 years ago, I think people did that yeah. more. And now there's a much more of an acceptance of doing something else. Yeah, yeah. Right? I think back then it was, well, if you were dedicated, you would have gone straight through. Yeah. And honestly, I think if you do that and your first job is doctor, yeah, that's that's really challenging. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. So let's le let's leap forward. Let's jump to the future. Tell me a little bit about uh, Hemonk Fellowship training. What is that like? What's a day in the life of a Hemonk Fellow? Oh, uh, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, um, you have a mix of inpatient and outpatient, and so if you're outpatient, you're either seeing hematology patients, uh, and that. You know, it runs the gamut from, as I said, like sickle cell disease. And this is all adult. You don't see peds, but you mm. will see, you know, like 19-year-olds who are transitioning their care from a pediatric hematologist to an adult hematologist. Mm. Uh, you'll see patients who have clotting disorders and other bleeding disorders. And sometimes they need to get uh, factor. They have to have factor replacement on a regular basis. Um, we see new patients who have you know, anemia or high platelets or low platelets or high hemoglobin or high white cells. And so you're sort of working that up. Mm -hmm. Frequently at an academic center that does hematology, the patient's already maybe been diagnosed mm -hmm. and they may be coming for a second opinion or for treatment, but still you see patients that have an, an, an unknown diagnosis. Sorry, no, I'm just, I'm wondering at what, cause you f focus more on the oncology mm -hmm. at this phase, yep. right? When can you decide that in fellowship? Is it kind of like you need to get your hours in or your, your reps yeah, in? Yeah, so, so you, you know, you do at Jefferson, yeah. you do, um, at least when I was in training, yeah. 
it was kind of a third, a third, a third. So it was a third general hematology. It was a third solid tumor oncology. And it was a third heme malignancy. Got it. And I think that may have shifted now. I'm not mm-hmm. entirely certain. But, you know, an outpatient day um, could be really normal where you're, you know, eight to five. Uh, if you are covering the consult service, right, you might have to go into the hospital and it's a new patient with a new diagnosis and you're doing a consult and you're doing a workup for their cancer. At Jefferson, there are inpatient services for leukemia and lymphoma and for the patients who have cancer who may have complications. So you're caring for them. You're doing bone marrow biopsies in the hospital. Um, you know, there's tumor boards, there's conferences. So it, it's pretty busy. Yeah. And, but varied, it's not boring, never boring, ever. And that that's one of the things that I really like about hematology and oncology. It is never boring. Never boring. Nope, because things are always changing. They're, they're, it's one of the fastest developing specialties in terms of treatments. And you see, at least I see patients with different things all the time at different stages. So for example, today I saw a woman who had lung cancer and she's in remission. She's doing beautifully. Um, I saw a man who has rectal cancer who is progressing and we have to talk about changing his treatment. So you have a real mix of people with different cancers at different stages of their journey. Yeah. Um, So I think when people hear oncology, they think, oh God, how can you do that? Well, it's not always like that. Yeah. I think that's really important to remember that you have an opportunity to go on this journey with the patient and whether that ends up being a shorter time period for them or longer, you're with them. And, and you know, so it's, it's a lot of palliative care and, and that's okay with me. I like that. You have to like palliative care to do oncology, but I would say a day in the life of an oncology fellow, it's busy. Not a lot of procedures except for, you know, bone marrow biopsies. You do intrathecal chemo where you put, um, you know, a needle in, you do a spinal tap and then you put chemo in there. Some patients have what's called an Omaya reservoir, which is kind of like a port that sits in the brain, Mm. named after an Egyptian doctor, Dr. Omaya. And so patients who have leukemia, who have to get a lot of intrathecal chemotherapy, will get an Omaya. Do you do you place that or does a No, the surgeons place the surgeons that. place yeah. that. But okay. you access it. Yeah. And you know, you might be giving treatment there. Um, so it's a mix of diagnosis yeah. and treatment plans and having conversations and a lot of medicine. Yeah. It's a lot of medicine. I can only and is internal medicine residency harder or was fellowship of hemo by harder I mean I don't mean I mean uh, just time intensity. I think I was probably more tired in residency. Got it. Temple was a very intense residency. Got it. Overnight call, every four nights, every three nights in the unit. And the units were very busy and we had a lot of autonomy, which was excellent. But tough. But really tough. That's how you learn, you know, because you have to make decisions by yourself in the middle of the night. Um, So I think in terms of just the level of fatigue, for me, internal medicine was more fatiguing. Yep. Um, you know, when you go on to do your fellowship, it's different. You have this confidence of knowing medicine, but then you're back down to having to learn something new. When I was in fellowship, there were fewer advanced practice providers. So, you know, there are NPs and PAs who, who do a lot now to help, and we didn't have that as much. So, there might be 30 patients on the leukemia lymphoma service with one attending and one fellow, and then residents. It's not like that anymore. Um, so it was- What is it like now? Uh, it's just, there are just fewer patients per team. Got it, okay. So now it used to be one big service, and now there's a service called Blue One and Blue Two, right? Leukemia and lymphoma or myeloma. Mm-hmm. And and so it it's, I mean, I spent a lot of time running I lost weight because I was running. (laughs) I was running so much I once stepped, dropped a bone marrow biopsy, dropped the slides I had made and stepped on them. Oh my God. Thank goodness. Did you have more bone marrow? Well, I didn't break them all. Okay. And the people in the lab, you know, you get to know the people in the heme lab and they helped me to kind of figure out the right pieces. But the hardest thing was I had to tell the attending. Oh no. Who was not known for being, I mean, he was- Relaxed. Yeah. 
an amazing physician, you know, but I was terrified. He was like, what do you mean you broke it? I was like, I broke it. Did you have to do another one? I did not, fortunately. Nice. Um, so it's a steep learning curve. Yeah. And if you are in a good place, you have good colleagues who really support you. And, and I, I felt fortunate that in my fellowship, I had good colleagues and we all supported each other. And so, you know, in the beginning, we were taking call a week at a time and then we'd kind of trade a night here and there so you'd get a break. Uh, I think it's a little gentler now in terms of overnight call. Got it, got it. And then when did geriatrics come into play and why? Ah. And how did you do it? So yeah. when, why, and okay. how? Because okay. it's, it's a new, you did it newly compared, yeah. right? You were the first one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, it was during oncology fellowship. Yes. In my second year of oncolo- oncology fellowship, I was working with a doctor who um, is very, very involved in geriatric oncology. Not fellowship trained, but pretty much brought geriatric oncology to Jefferson. And I was working with him and, you know, he said, I, I think you should get more involved in this. And there is a group called the Cancer and Aging Research Group. It was started in the mid 2000s. And he said, why don't you come to these meetings? You know, there were telephone meetings. And so I listened in and I got interested and I got more interested. And then he said, you know, why don't you consider doing a fellowship? You should consider it because then, you know, you can stay here and we can do geriatric oncology. Um, and I thought about it and I thought about it because it would mean, of course, delaying my career by another year. And at this point, you know, between, right? So I took all that time for med school. It took a year between med school and residency, had a kid, took a year between residency and fellowship and worked and had another kid, then did a three-year fellowship and was looking at doing another fellowship, right? So it was a kind of a big decision. You want to get, it's, it's, you're like, I'm ready. Right, right. And so when I said before that I take my time to come to things, um, it took me, it definitely took me time to figure that out. And once I did, I, uh, I went to the family medicine division at, at, or the family medicine department at Jefferson. Um, oh my God, the amazing people, just the nicest people ever, especially the geriatricians. They are the nicest doctors. Hands nicer down. than pediatricians. Nicer than pediatricians. Wow, it's a bold statement. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I have many pediatrician friends, yes. but yes, geriatricians <laughs> are the nicest. So I, I interviewed and it was out of the match. So they said, yeah, we would love to have you. And the other people in the fellowship came from family medicine residency. I see, okay. So it was a four-person fellowship, three family medicine docs and me. Wow. And it was probably the best year of my training. Really? I loved it. I mean, it was- Loved it. Well, so for many reasons. One, it was less intense than everything I had done. You know, not to say that geriatrics is not worthy of intensity, just by nature of it, it's just less intense. You know, you go out to a nursing home and hang out with some people and you talk to them. And I had a patient with dementia who called me names. I mean, it was, you know, it was just, it was a slower pace. It was a really nice break in that intensity while still being able to learn an amazing amount of stuff. I had three months of palliative care training in my geriatrics fellowship, wow. which was three times as much as I got in my oncology fellowship. Wow. Which is different now. Yeah. Again, there's much more palliative care being incorporated in, but yep. at the time, not as much. So it gave me a perspective on my oncology training that is invaluable. Absolutely. I can only imagine. Can yeah, only it was imagine. great. And then you're an attending. Then I'm an attending. What's that like? Is it I a golden ticket? You panic like attack the, every day. Really? <laughs> Like halfway through the halfway through my day, every day I would look at my schedule and think, "Oh my god, how am I going to get through this? I don't know what these people have. I don't know what I'm doing." Um, it's it's you know it's not a golden ticket. Yeah, right. It's um, it's again it's a learning curve. You know that's what medicine is. You start here, you go here, you end up here. You do this, you do that. Right. You you're constantly coming to a place where you have to become comfortable. Yeah, which I think. Is good because it pushes you. Yeah. Right. 
pushes you to learn. It pushes you to grow. And, but yeah, I, I distinctly remember thinking, oh my God, every day, all right, I, I can do this. I can get through today. Just have to get through today. Yep. And if you don't know it, you ask or you look it up. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great point. Do you, do you remember any of those first patients you had or any of what they had? And it was like, I have no idea. It was like, I got this. I can do, I'm a confident attending. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to crush it. <laughs> uh, I don't think I Kim. felt like I was a confident attending. I Got mean, it. just okay. by the sheer nature of the fact that yeah. you, that's it, it's yeah. you, right? The responsibilities on it, you. The responsibilities on you. So you, you know, it's by nature, you sort of second guess yourself a little bit and you wonder and you think, oh my goodness, am I doing the right thing? And, and, um, and then after, you know, a year or two, you kind of, okay, I've done this before. Yeah. And I could do this. And it's okay. Yeah. And you realize that, I mean, one of the nice things about a specialty like Hemonc is that when, what I do, not leukemia, right? What I do, there are almost no emergencies. Mm-hmm. I don't like emergencies. I mean, I, I'm okay with them, but it's not when I do my best thinking. hmm uh, so I don't want to be in a position where somebody is coding or somebody is, you know, having a blast crisis. I don't, I don't feed on that. Mm-hmm. I would much rather sit down and say, all right, well, you know, let's talk about what are your goals of care, mm-hmm. right? Have a nice, meaty conversation about that. Um, so that was nice for me to kind of get into that, the feeling that, okay, I don't have to solve these problems right this second. Mm-hmm. And that is you could take, take a breath. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, all right, I can look this up. I can say to the patient, your case isn't clear. We need, to, we need to figure this out. I mean, I'm trying to think about patients that I had in the beginning. I inherited a lot of patients, yeah. right? Um, and I had some patients where I made mistakes, as we all do. And I had patients who, um, you know, it's inevitable that when you inherit patients, people say, well, Dr. So-and-so did this and Dr. So-and-so did that. And again, with time, you sort of get to a point where you say, okay, that's all right. That must have been nice. I mean, you just have to that's let nice. that go. Right. This is how right. we're going to do it now. Well, <laughs> yeah. um, I don't practice patriarchal medicine. Got it. I really try not to, which interestingly for a lot of old people is hard for them because they want to be told what to do. Mm. So I have to balance that of when I say, all right, well, what would you like to do? And they'll say, I want what you do to you tell think me yeah. what to do. Right. So you figure out when to tell people what to do. It's, it's, it's interesting because I feel like it's a really tough balancing act to play because if, if you talk about maybe one treatment or one side of, so this is just in, in a very broad sense. If you say, listen, we could go through the treatment Right, and we, there's this chances of things working out, right? Or we could go the palliative side, and this can happen. It seems like a tough conversation to have, especially if in your head you're leaning in one direction. How do you do that? Do you just say the facts? Do you just say? Do you say you don't say? I think you should do this. I'm I'm, I'm just curious how you have these discussions with people at these obviously very tough times without leading them in one direction or the other direction. It's an excellent question because we all have bias. Yeah. Right? We're all going to have bias and you're going to have bias about who should be a full code and who yeah. shouldn't. And letting go of that is, is a skill that should be practiced routinely, right? Because what you think is right may not be what that patient wants. And you can explain all of the different outcomes that can happen based on the decisions that they make. Yeah. But ultimately, they need to make a decision that goes with their goals of care. And, yeah. and I guess I'll take like a little tangent. Yeah. But one thing that I always try to do is I try to elicit their goals without talking about treatment or anything like that. Just sort of say like, well, where do you see yourself, you know, if you get really sick and when it comes time to die, where do you want to be and who do you want to be around you? And kind of follow that and get their answers, Mm -hmm. right? Once you elicit that, then you can say, well, based on what you've said, based on your goals, based on what you want, I think this would be a good choice for you. I see. Right. So you offer them the opportunity to say what they want, and then you can present something that is in line with their goals of care yeah. rather than presenting it and then saying, What do you want? Yeah. 
Um, so going back to the tough decision, yeah, I try to, I try to give all of the choices and I try to really avoid saying, well, we could do this or we could do nothing because we're never doing nothing, right? Yeah. Ever. Yep. You might just see a patient and talk about their favorite soup. I mean, that's not nothing. That's company and they feel listened to and, you know, you might do a little evaluation in there as well. So that is a key thing to take away. Yeah. Um, the terms everything and nothing are to be avoided. But you can say, well, if we do this, it could offer you this. If your goals are to maybe have a good quality of life, this might be a better choice for you. I can't tell you exactly how you'll react to the chemo, but you know we can always start and then stop. So I try to lay it out in, a, in terms that gives them some autonomy. Yeah. Cancer in, in particular, I mean, all disease, but cancer in particular makes people feel like they have no control, which they often don't, right? People will say, what did I do or what can I do? There's not much, you know? There's no point in saying, well, you know, you smoked. That's not helpful ever because they know that. So um, the only time you can really do that is when you talk about risk of recurrence, right? You can say, well, cut back on your drinking, this and that. But in general... Um, people feel a lack of control. So by helping them to try to pick something or go down a road that gives them control, I think is really useful for them in, in navigating. Um, so the conversations are hard. And again, it takes practice. You yeah. have to practice. Is it hard dealing with a lot of people who are often very sick and might not live much much longer? I, I think this comes. this question comes from the stereotype that I was put given in my head as an early medical student of what all cancer doctors do. You know, they're all depressed because they're all just de- what We were told even this, and of course, the other med students were joking and stuff like that, but they're like, the cancer service is really interesting. You learn a lot, but you're going to be depressed by the end of it. Yeah. Well, that's inpatient. Yeah. So inpatient is very hard. Yeah. Because all those cancer patients are sick. Yeah. Or they're getting a new diagnosis. Mm-hmm. So either way, it kind of sucks. Yeah. Um, and that is really different from how outpatient oncology is. Okay. And again, we have a lot of patients who are in survival. Yeah. You know, I see patients who are coming to see me five, six, sometimes 10 years wow. from their cancer diagnosis. I have a lot of patients who have early stage breast cancer. They're being treated for cure. Um, so the outpatient setting is not all doom and gloom. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, there are patients who progress. Fortunately, in this day and age, there are many different types of treatment, a lot of tools in the toolbox. So the days of, oh, you've got lung cancer, you got six months, are mostly gone, right? That's very much person dependent. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you've got an 89-year-old with small cell lung cancer, you know, that's that may be a true statement mm-hmm. to say you have about six months. But I think that we do have challenging conversations. On the other hand, you can think about it. It's always an opportunity, right? If you're giving somebody a diagnosis, then you have an opportunity to find out what their goals are and to try to help them to achieve those goals, right? If you have somebody who's progressing, then you have an opportunity to revisit their goals and talk about you know, what's going to be the right step for you. And having more treatment to offer can be a double-edged sword. Yeah. It's usually good. But then you sometimes get to a place where people say, well, I read about this treatment. I read about this treatment. Why can't I have it? Because they might be dying anyway and the treatment Mm -hmm. isn't going to help them. Yeah. So I think it is not all doom and gloom for sure. There's a lot of ways that you can help patients who are oncology patients. It's wonderful to see patients do well. There are many cancers in which you treat someone and the treatment makes them better. You know, I get patients who come to see me, they're on oxygen, they're losing weight. You treat them, they come off the oxygen, they feel good, even if they have metastatic cancer. Wow. So you can affect positive change in all of these patients. Um, and, and yes, does it happen that sometimes you see patients and they're really, really sick and they die soon? Yeah, it happens. And there are patients that affect you more than others, mm-hmm. for sure. But if you become a nephrologist, you will have patients on dialysis who die. If you become a cardiologist, you're going to deal with a lot of heart failure. Um, 
you know, if you become a gastroenterologist, you're going to be diagnosing people with all kinds of stuff. horrible things. Yes, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, and and that's why it's so great that people do different specialties yeah. because somebody in that specialty will say, yes, but we can do this. So I, I don't think you have to be Pollyanna-ish yeah. for oncology. I, I don't think that. I think that there's a lot of space for the... the to allow sadness yeah. and to allow grieving who you were before your cancer diagnosis, but it is not all sad. Yeah, yeah. How much of the spikes protocol thing that we're taught in medical school is actually, do you, you, have you found, when you're giving obviously bad news, do you follow the spikes <laughs> protocol is what I guess I'm asking. <laughs> setting, choose a private, comfortable, non-threatening setting. P, perception. Uncover what patients and family think is happening. I, invitation. Ask patients what they would like to know. K, knowledge. Explain disease and care options in plain language. E, emotion. Respect feelings. Respond with empathy. Empathy. S, summarize, recap, and decide what's next. Because we're told to say, uh, for example, um, are you ready to hear bad news? Do you want anyone to be in here with you when you hear the bad news? Um, and then say, what do you know about X? Mm -hmm. And then that kind of thing. Is that what you do? Not exactly, Got but it. I do think there are elements of that that are, that are true. Got it, okay. So um, I think that if you have an opportunity to have somebody else present, that's always good. But you don't want the lead up to be so dramatic that the patient is in a puddle of sweat when you start to talk yeah. to them. Yeah, that's what it's like. <laughs> right? like, okay, are you ready? <laughs> yeah. Because the bomb's about to drop. You're right. It doesn't sound, yeah. You want yeah. someone, you know. Yeah. But you can say, all right, you know, we have to talk about this and I, I wish that I had better news for you. But unfortunately, it looks like blah, blah, blah. So you, you sort of, you soften the blow. So you go right, you kind of come out with it pretty quickly. Yeah, though. because yeah. patients don't want to, yeah. you know, if, especially, well, if it's good news. Yeah. I will open the door and say, your scans look great because yeah. they've been waiting, Yeah. right? If it's bad news, then I do think it's important to soften the blow a little bit. You don't want to necessarily say, I have bad news for you, but you might want to say, you know, we need to talk about your scans because unfortunately it looks like the cancer has progressed. Mm -hmm. And then you stop, right? And you, you wait to see what the patient does. They might want to be silent. They might want to ask questions. They might cry. They might say, can I bring my husband in? You know, that waiting and silence is really important in those moments. So I think it is important to make sure you're in the right setting. If you're in an office, if you're in your exam room, then I think that's usually fine. And then I will often ask patients, you know, how much do you know about what's going on? Um, and it's so interesting, all the different responses mm. that you get. I mean, some patients get panicked, like, am I being quizzed? And I'll have to say, it's not a quiz. I just <laughs> want to make sure that I am not talking about things you don't know about or yeah. that, you know, that we're on the same page. So, and also that helps to get a sense of, you know, how savvy are they about the medical system, yeah. right? Um, because many patients will nod and they have no idea what you're talking about because they don't want to be embarrassed. Right. So asking what they know and what they understand is it is helpful. And then you can, I will usually start to talk about what it means and what to do. I will sometimes say, okay, stop me if you get overwhelmed. Do you understand everything I'm saying? Um, if I know that we're going to be talking about a result, whether it's going to be good or bad, for some patients, I will say, bring someone with you, especially for patients who don't have a great memory. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes with knowing your patients, right? So I do think that uh, asking the patient about knowledge, like how much do you want to know or letting them know that they can say stop, I think that's useful. Um, what was the I? Inviting people to- The, the I, so the K else. was knowledge. Yeah. And then the I was invitation. Ask the patient what they would like to know. Yeah, and, and I do think that that's reasonable. Yeah, okay. Because you will get people who say, I, I don't know, you just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Yeah. Right? And, and that's fair, but I will push that a little bit. Yeah. Because I will say, look, this is about you. 
This is your body. This is your cancer. And I really want to make sure that I'm meeting your goals. I don't ever want to hurt you. I don't ever want to do something that you feel is not in line with what you want. So let's talk about that a little bit more so I can kind of get a sense. You know, yeah. you have to push it a little bit sometimes, gently. And and empathy, you know, of course. Yeah, I mean, you Yeah, you have to be very patient. Yeah. You have to be really patient. And you have to lean into these conversations of, uh, you know, being able to talk about death and dying is yeah. hard. And I really do think it takes practice. Um, and you don't have to do it all at once, which is why starting conversations like this early on, where you maybe test the waters a little bit, you just ask, oh, if you couldn't make decisions for yourself, who would make them for you, right? Then you can come back to that and say, well, you said so-and-so would make decisions. Have you talked about the kinds of things that you would want? Oh, and what are those things, right? So you, you do it a little bit at a time so the patient doesn't suddenly feel like, why are they talking about this with me? Am I yeah. dying right now? Yeah. Because that will happen. Patients will say, well, am I dying right now? I, I think that the spikes protocol is a good structure. Yeah. And then you have to make it your own. Yeah. And you have to read the room. Yeah. And you have to practice so that you are comfortable saying words like death and dying. Yeah. Again, it's not all of what we do. Yeah. But it is, it is a good amount of what we do. Do you get patients that say, I don't want to know anything, don't tell me anything? Uh, very, very, very rarely. And and how do you, because it's confusing, not only ethics-wise, right, but also how you actually go about doing that. Right. How, in right. those rare cases, because you see these on TV and stuff yeah. like that's why. Yeah. But um, how do you actually, when these situations happen, how do you manage them? And, and do they actually not want to know anything forever? I had a patient who used to get really upset with me because I would try to have goals of care conversations with her. Mm. And she she would tell me, I really don't look forward to coming to see you. You're upsetting me. And of course, I was horrified, mm -hmm. right? Jeez. But it ended up being a really good opportunity for both of us because she said to me, look, this is just too much. And I said, all right, we can, we can focus on the positive. So we did that. And she knew it was happening. Mm -hmm. She had pancreatic cancer. She knew it was happening. I didn't have to constantly remind her, but we would focus on, oh, you know, you're eating a little more, that's great. And she went to New Orleans with her family and she felt good. She just didn't want me to hammer it in every single time. And she didn't, she didn't really want all of the results. So in this case, she actually had a um, brother-in-law who was a physician, an oncologist. Oh, wow. So I would talk with him. Yeah, and he an would, oncologist too, wow. Yeah. And he would, in another city, and he would, um, so I would talk with him on the phone and he would kind of break news to her. So that was one of the more challenging situations. But once I got to the point where I stopped pushing my agenda, it was actually much better. Mm. And we both said, this is great. We have a better relationship now because I wasn't trying to force her to have these goals of care conversations and she wasn't getting anxious and depressed every time she came to see me. Yeah. And we would just sort of talk about how she was feeling and what made her feel good. And, you know, eventually she died. But yeah. it wasn't, I needed to be sensitive to her needs in a way that I was able to let go and really see what I was doing and how it might have been damaging the relationship. And we had a great conversation about it. It, it, was, it was really... Um, very unique. I had not had another situation like that where I came and said, you know, you're right. I am doing this too much. Yeah, it was- it Went was, both ways almost. Yeah, yeah, it did. I was, it was the kind of feedback that was initially hard to hear. Yeah. But then I thought, well, God, why is she upset coming to see me? You know, you, you have to be open to that. Yeah, yeah. Have you learned any- life lessons from treating, you know, su such a range of patients? Right, this is a big question, right? Or, or, any, yeah. or anything like, I'm just trying to see if there's, and this may be um, a not super well thought out question, but if there's anything kind of that you didn't think about, because I think when I think whenever I, whenever the time comes for me or something like this, you know, you think, um, you know, I want to be around family and all these kind of things. Are there any things that you've kind of realized that, Oh, I never thought this would be so important to some people, but now when they come to this time, it's 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 a, 
very important to these people. I didn't think, like for example, maybe they want to eat a, like a hamburger or something completely random like this, you know? is I'm just curious if there's any things that have appeared when people come to these stages, you know, a, a lot of people say they find religion or, or things like this, anything that, that stands out to you. It doesn't have to be a life lesson or anything like that. Well, there, I, th I feel like there are a lot of things that I yeah. learned, um, partially about myself and partially about patients and about what people want when they die. Yeah. Um, so first, what I will say is everybody's life is short, relatively speaking, right? And it, it doesn't really feel like that when you're 25 mm -hmm. so much. When you're 50, it does. Mm. And so I think taking time to feed yourself, you know, metaphorically yeah. speaking, is a really important thing. Yeah. Um, which is why I now take longer vacations. Yeah. So I think that's important. I think it's important, as I said before, to make sure that what you assume that people want is not always what people want and to be really open to um, allowing different thoughts and different ideas to kind of come into play. Um, people want to maintain their dignity. I think any patient does, and that's a really important thing to think about when you are interacting with patients in the hospital. They are unclothed, they're not where they want to be, they're scared. And so you want to try to maintain dignity as much as possible. And particularly at the end of life, people are worried about what they're going to do and what it's going to be like. You know, we see funerals and we see all the stuff that happens after death but nobody can tell you what it's like to die. So um, it's a very scary time. And, and that's the time where we have to focus on helping people figure out what they want. Most of the time people say they wanna be at home. I have had people say, no, nope, I don't wanna be at home. Why would I do that to my family, right? I think uh, you learn a lot about altruism in terms of, you know, it can make people feel very good to help other people. Patients, listening, being open, that is gonna serve you really well. So in terms of a life lesson, listen. Listen, listen. Which is hard when you're starting out because yeah. you are so focused on, oh my God, I gotta get the H&P. Yeah. I gotta get the H&P. <laughs> <laughs> you know, PQRS pain. Oh. Right, like, yeah. like that is, and, and that's fine. Yeah. Like that's what you're doing, that's your job. So your job is to try to gather the information and make sense of it. But if you can always think about in the back of your mind that listening for an extra five minutes, you can sometimes learn unbelievable things about people and it helps you to create a relationship with somebody um, that engenders trust which is really important when you're in a specialty mm -hmm. where you see people in an ongoing fashion. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I think listening is... Huge. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. So let's jump into the logistics a little bit more of your life. Because I know it can vary differently depending on on day-to-day -day or week-to-week. -week. But could you try, and I know it's, again, tough because you've been in different places to describe to me an average week for yourself, when you'll wake up, when you go to the hospital or the clinic, kind of what the split up, what the a normal life of a hematologist, oncologist is like. Yeah. Um, I work in an office that is a multi-specialty building. Yeah. So there's medical oncology, radiation oncology, gynecologic oncology. There are um, caseworkers there. It's a, it's a fairly large building, but it's freestanding. And I usually get to work around 7.30, I would say. And I like to be there before my eight o'clock patient. I don't like to come in, put my stuff down and see a patient. I wanna review stuff, I wanna think about stuff. So I'm usually up, I would say awake around six. I go in, I have, my visits are 30 minute visits, which is wonderful. Uh, it's an hour for new patients. So I have the time to see a patient, talk about what's going on, make a plan, write my note, get other things done in that 30 minutes. Wow. It's wonderful. Yeah. One day a week I work downtown, the visits are 20 minutes and that extra 10 minutes makes a big difference in how my day goes. Because if I can finish my day and all my notes are done, it's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have to go home and think about doing work, right? Um, so, you know, you, 
you, um, and I tend to spend a long time with patients. So I yeah. usually fill that time. Yeah. Not everybody does, but see patients. Um, sometimes there will be a tumor board in the middle of the day. Thank you, Zoom. Now you can, you know, listen into a tumor board uh, from wherever you are. Um, I personally do not like to overbook. I don't like to book through lunch. I don't like to double book. There are a lot of doctors who do that, but I know that it will really drain me. I'm a really sensitive person and I'm, I'm really present. Like I give a lot when I'm with a patient. So if I have to work through lunch, I have no time to decompress. So I don't do that. There are some doctors who do that. And I would say an average day is probably around 12 or 13 patients. Sometimes it's fewer if I have new patients because that's an hour long. And I would say I have probably um, maybe one, anywhere from one to four new patients a day. And the new patients can be, you know, hematology, oncology. I usually finish up, uh, finish seeing patients around four o'clock. And then there will often be tumor boards after that. And so I might go home around 5.30, maybe six. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it was longer when I was starting out mm -hmm. because I would see the patient and then I would write all my notes at the end of the day. Mm. Um, and I needed more time to process. I couldn't write a note in the room because I just needed to think and I needed to figure out what I wanted to do. And so it, that's just evolved for me. Mm. Um, I, I like to get home. I mean, I'm the cook. In yeah. the house. So <laughs> if I want to eat something that's yeah. not grilled cheese, yeah. um, <laughs> I have to go home and cook. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's not terrible. So that's yeah. a day in the office. Yeah. And I would say that if you work in academic oncology, you probably have a couple days in the office and a couple days where you're supposed to be doing research mm -hmm. or you're writing or something like that. Um, if you are in in the community, there are some places where you might see patients every 15 minutes, you know, but you may have a nurse practitioner who goes in, does all the work for you, and then you come in and sort of sign off. So it's different everywhere. But I would say I feel like my day is relatively typical, maybe a little bit better because of that longer, the 30 minute yep. visit. Um, we also cover the hospital. So about once a month, I go in and I spend a day helping with consults mm. in the hospital. And then about once every eight to 10 weeks, I spend a week in the hospital. Mm. Did you make a, uh, a, like a decision to do this work more in the outpatient setting? Is there a moment where you say, you talk to some supervisor or some advisor? I'm always wondering when I speak to attendings, because you know, I was speaking to, um, the other day I was speaking to a cardiothoracic surgeon who says, you know, I do mostly lobectomies and these kind of other things. I don't really do this kind. I'm just wondering how logistically this happens as an attending, how you get to say within your subspecialty, you know, I'm either going to focus on this thing or within the subspecialty, I'm going to focus in this practice setting. Right. Do you know what I mean? I do know what you mean. And mostly that comes with time. Got because okay. when you're new, you have no say. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, the, only, the only card I think I had was the geriatrics card. Got it, okay. And even that, um, you know, I now really try to see only patients over 65. Yep. Um, but they'll, they'll put 58-year-olds in there. They'll put younger patients yeah. uh, occasionally. And... When you're starting out, you can't say no, really. Yeah. But then as you develop your skill set, you know, and then you can say, you know, I really would like to focus on this. And then you sort of are able to carve that out. In terms of time in the office or out of the office, um, some of that just has to do with the logistics of your practice, right? Uh, we all work four and a half days a week. I think there are a couple of guys who work four days a week. And that... You know, some of the older guys are cutting back on their time. But it's it, it develops. Mm -hmm. You know, if you happen to, during fellowship, work with somebody, let's say you work with someone who does breast oncology, when you come out, you're going to look for a practice and say, I specialize in breast oncology. I see. Okay, and I then, got it. you know, that's what it. you'll be doing. Mm -hmm. You have a lot less say about inpatient, outpatient, because that's just how the practice runs. I see. We, as a practice made decisions about beefing up the inpatient service because we were going crazy. I, I mean, if you've got a list of 50 patients, what are you supposed to do? Leave. No. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so it's um, that sort of thing happens more organically. Yeah, you know, and your first job doesn't have to be your only job. Yeah, I see. It's important to remember. That's a good point. Yeah, That's a good point. Yeah. So, if I gave you one hundred million dollars today, tax free, it's in your account. You don't have to do it. You don't have to pay anyone or anything like this. Would you a continue to work full time? B switch to working part time. C, switch careers entirely and become a professional surfer or something like this. Or D, quit working entirely and go live on a beach with your family or something like this. Um, I'm afraid of sharks, so I can't afraid be of a sharks. surfer. No, no surfer. So beach might hurt. hurt too. Uh, I, I do like the beach. You know, this is a question I've asked myself. Yes. Um, if I suddenly became very, very wealthy, what yeah. would I do? I wouldn't work in healthcare as it is now. Okay. Um, my dream job would be to do um, almost like private consultations in geriatric mm-hmm. oncology so that if you take your dad to the oncologist and he's 80, you know, you hire me to review everything and say, you know, I would do X, Y, and Z with your meds and I would review, you know, I would do this or that. So Like a geriatric oncologist consultant. Yeah, right. But from an economic standpoint, that's that can be hard to do, mm-hmm. um, and I am not in medicine to do business. You know, yeah. I don't, I'm not. I would have gotten an MBA. Yeah, exactly. But I think that there's a need for that, mm-hmm. and I think, you know, if I didn't have to worry about money, then I could do that as I as I like, mm. and I think it would be really beneficial. And then, you know, could be offered to people who really don't have. Um, uh, anybody to help them. Mm. And the other thing that I would probably do is build a really nice hospice. Really, really, really nice hospice. Mm. And, you know, people who could afford it would pay and people yeah. who couldn't wouldn't have to. Wow. So it sounds like you would pick the part-time option and do yeah, these other things. Yeah, I would pick a, a sort of a part-time, yeah. you know, I um I wouldn't want to stop working. Yeah. I would I would not want to feel indebted to work. Yeah. And I don't know that I do, although with a kid going to college in the fall. Yeah. You know. Um so I do think I would still work. I do love what I do. I yeah. really man, give me an 85-year-old, I'm happy. <laughs> Seriously, like yeah. I just I love it. Yeah. And so I think I wouldn't want to start. I would work part-time, but I would shape it to how I want it to be. Got it, got it. What is the worst thing about being a hematologist oncologist? It doesn't need to be the overall answer. Or what is a bad thing about being a hematologist <laughs> oncologist? I like to start with the ultimate. Um, and then, and then right. Leave Getting a consult at 4.30 on a Friday <laughs> for somebody who has low platelets and their platelets have been low all week. <laughs> Um, but that's when you kill the internal medicine resident. Uh, <laughs> it's not often the residents, I will tell you. Really? Yeah, it's like, you know, it's um, uh, getting consult on every single DVT that walks through the door, having to educate people that a low MCV is not always iron deficiency. Is there anything you wish you knew before becoming a hematologist oncologist? Do you mind? I think it can be challenging to try to help people to try to drop the stigma of palliative care and hospice. Mm -hmm. Um, So learning more about that, like I probably, I might've even done more palliative care training Mm -hmm. because I think that's really important. So I think that, that I, I guess I wish that I had had more palliative care training um, leading up to it. And yeah. that's why the geriatrics fellowship was so good. Yeah. Because it made me more comfortable with it. But I don't know. No, that's, I don't. that's good answers. Now we get the counterpoint question, which people usually like more. What is the best thing about being a hematologist oncologist? Oh, the best thing is um, helping people to feel cared about, to feel supported. You know, one thing I tell people is look, even if you're, even if you can't get chemo anymore because mm-hmm. you're not well enough, I'll still see you. I'll still take care of you. Mm. Wow. You're not going to be abandoned. Wow. Um, so helping people feel 
cared about and taken care of is is really great. I mean, of course, it's great when you cure people. Yeah. But I have a weird relationship with the idea of cure because um, it's hard. It must be hard to say that as their physician. It You're is. You're cured. It is. I don't say it. You don't say it. No. You never say it. Very rarely. Okay. Only if I'm forced to. Yeah. Because I think you see it happen. I've got patients who have had cancer 20 years ago and it comes back. Mm -hmm. So I always like to say, well, we can't see it. It's in remission. As far as we know, you don't have any cancer. That's great. You live your life. You know, sometimes cancer comes back, but you know, you're in remission. I'm just, I really hedge over that because it's so devastating for patients who said, I was told I was cured and now it's back. Mm. So I don't actually think that the best part about being an oncologist is curing people. Yeah. That is not. It's having relationships with people and their families and realizing that you you can help people to feel less scared, I think. Yeah. No, that's great. That's really nice. So if I'm an internal medicine resident or if I'm a medical student and I'm kind of thinking about hematology, oncology, but I'm not really sure. Is it what should I do to make this decision more clear to myself? Shadow, Shadow. in the outpatient setting. In the Absolutely. outpatient setting. In the outpatient setting. If that's where you're going to be doing most of your stuff. I mean, if you if you feel like, oh my gosh, I gotta do leukemia, I gotta treat leukemia, then you want to shadow a leukemia doctor. But even they do outpatient stuff. So I would say that um, you know, see a variety. Go see if you can follow somebody who sees who does general oncology. Um, you know, do see if you can do extra rotations. I think you can become a student member of ASCO, the American mm. Society of Clinical Oncology. I think you can. I mean, mm. when I was a fellow, we were yeah. members of that. So they, all of these societies have reduced membership or sometimes free membership for students. So you can get involved even at that level. Mm-hmm. And they, you could you know, check out like the junior faculty mm-hmm. stuff. There's always early career trainee stuff and you can investigate that. And, yeah. you know, if you happen to be able to go to a meeting, that's, I think, really useful. I think this is a great point because th- that sounds good, but the outpatient stuff I want to emphasize even more because I have never done outpatient oncology shadowing oh, ever. I've the, My only experience with oncology is is Blue 3. Yeah. That's my only experience with oncology. And it's, this is, but this is the reason I have these conversations, right? Because... I, I didn't know about this. You know, I think all cancer is like, it's this. We got to figure this out. The patient's not happy in the moment in the hospital. But of course, there's this outpatient side. Of course, people get better. Of course, there's amazing interactions. And of course, when they're your patients, I can only imagine the interactions are 10 times better for that reason. Um, so that's great. So the outpatient shadowing is yeah. something you got to do. Absolutely. Do. Absolutely. And more than once. Yeah. You know, yeah. because... You know what I see on a given day is just totally varies yeah. from day to day, and there are times when I'm happy I have a student or a resident with me, and we get to do like a goals of care talk. Um, you know, because I want them to see that I want yeah. them to see how I do it and what it's like. And most of the time, I would say students are like, wow, that was great. So I I think that that would be to repeatedly do mm-hmm. that to get a sense of what it's really like. Yeah. Um, the hospital part is such a small percentage and I, I don't think it's, it's actually kind of not fair to not give the outpatient because then people end up thinking that oncology is just yeah. horrible. That's, I, I mean, it wasn't super bad, but I was like, this is kind of, we're having a lot of palliative care discussions and these people are really sick. They're very sick. They're really sick. And I'm like, this is, that's why, that's where that first case, question came from earlier, like, how are you not really depressed and sad all the time? Because it's like, it was, it was tough. It was honestly a little bit tough, especially as one of my first experiences in the, in the inpatient side of the hospital. I was like, this is, this is insane. Say you're an M1, you're a first year medical student, and you know 100% you want to be a hematologist, oncologist, 100% your first year of med school. How can they be the most competitive applicant for fellowship? How can they be the most rock star killer student or physician resident to get into any program to do anything they want in hematology, oncology? This, uh, is, the, this is the med school question. Yeah, this is this the med is, student this is question. The question yeah. Right, yeah, absolutely. Well, research. Research. Yeah, yeah. That is really important is to get involved in something. If you can get involved in something that's longitudinal. Yeah. Right. Um, try to be involved in something you like yep. so that when you discuss it, 
yeah. you are actually excited about mm-hmm. it. Um, you know, that that's for better or for worse, that is the thing. Yeah. So if you absolutely know that you want to do Hemonk, find research opportunities up front. Yep. Um, I think developing rapport with some oncologists who can actually write letters on your behalf yeah. or, you know, where you can potentially get on a project and, you know, see it through from abstract to poster to paper. Um, that's, I think, really valuable. No, that's huge. Uh, that being said, you know, you don't, you don't have to do that in med school. Um, you know, you, you want to be involved and you want to be passionate. Um, but, I mean, not all the research that I did was in oncology. I did a lot of different stuff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, like, one of the things I did was learning to auscultate murmurs. You know, so I think it's a combination of... I need that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you do. Yeah, um, but I think it's a it's a combination of things. Definitely get involved in longitudinal research. Try to find somebody who's a mentor, and it's okay if it doesn't work out. You know, I think I think that it's hard to be a mentor because it requires time, and even people with the best intentions as a mentor may not be able to really give you what you need or want. Um, so show up, be interested, mm-hmm. be eager. I think those are good things, yeah. you know. No, that's great. So let's broaden a little bit. Let's talk a little bit more about um, being in the healthcare field. Do you have any pieces of advice for students or even students for, like myself who are just about to enter the real world when I'm actually going to be a real doctor? And this can be around anything. This can be around lifestyle, this can be around relationships, this can be around books to read, this can be around finances, this could be around best way to learn the actual medicine that you're going to be practicing with patients. It could be anything. A uh, couple things. One, I don't believe in work-life balance. Okay. I think it's a pendulum. Okay. I don't remember where I heard this. I'm probably stealing it from someone. Yeah. But I think it's important to remember that there will be times when uh, things are really, really heavy at work. And if you have a partner... You know, that's an important concept to share with them because there'll be times when they might have to pick up a lot of slack, yeah. but then you'll be able to give it back. Yeah. So thinking about it more like a pendulum, it's less stress of, oh, I've always got to be balanced because because that's very, very difficult. Yeah. When you are a physician, you're in healthcare, you naturally give a lot of yourself to your job. Um, so, you know, thinking about, okay, it's hard right now, but it will get better. Mm-hmm. It helps to keep you motivated, right? Like, okay, this week is hard, but I'm going to take a day off next week. So take days off. Yeah. Take days off. Randomly take a day off in the middle of the month and just do whatever you want to do. Um, Because work will go on without you and it'll be okay. Yep. You know? So I find that to be a really good way to recharge. Just take a day off. And turn everything off. Um, you know, healthcare is very administrative. And either you're going to go into private practice, uh, which is very hard to do. It's almost impossible to do as an oncologist because of the cost of drugs. So if you have to buy chemo, right, and then like get reimbursed, it's just impossible now mm-hmm. with the way things cost. Drugs are tens of thousands of dollars. Wow. Um, so you will be working in a healthcare system. And I think it's important to uh, stand up for yourself. Um, you know, probably probably good to have a lawyer look at your first contract. Make sure that you um, have the things that you want in there. Like, I bargained for more CME money because I go to conferences. You know, I, I usually go to the annual oncology conference. I go to the, I'm a member of the International Society of Geriatric Oncology. And... I like to go to the meetings. Mm-hmm. They're usually overseas. So, you know, everybody gets burnt out at one time or another. We, we as physicians are very driven. We're super driven. That's what makes us, that's how we get to where we are. So I think we have this idea that we can't ever really stop or, you know, you can't, 
you can't fail at anything. People say this thing, oh, be kind to yourself, but you sort of have to be, you know, like this is, I think, one of the reasons why people have a hard time talking about death because <clears throat> it can feel like a failure on our own part. Mm. Like I didn't fix your cancer. So I think, um, you know, be kind to yourself. It's a marathon. And look for a practice. I mean, this is like looking for residency, you know, where you feel good around the, about the people you're with, um, that you click with them, that, mm -hmm. you know, you feel like it's collegial. Uh, it's, you know, have kids, get married. You don't have to wait. Um, there's no perfect time, but you can do it. I mean, you know, I'm married. We haven't killed each other yet. We have, <laughs> we have two kids who do not want to become physicians, which is fine with me. Really? Oh, yeah. Really. They said, no way we're being doctors. Well, my daughter is deathly afraid of needles. Okay. She's getting much better. Yes. But uh, no, it's just not, I mean, she's what very- do they want to, What do they want to be? Uh, well, my my daughter's starting Haverford in the fall and wow. is interested in uh, climate science. And she is a phenomenal artist. Wow. And she's a really good artist. Wow. And it's not just because I'm her mom, but she's, so she will definitely do something with that. Yeah. I don't know. My son wants to be a rock star. That's cool. You know, he's 13 and he wants to play guitar. It's almost cool. It's almost cool. Becoming cool again to be want to be a rock star, you know what I mean? Because it's because you know what I mean. It's because it's right now. I feel like a lot of people want to be like a streamer or a YouTuber uh, or like yeah. a thing. Like it's almost like going the other way. It's like uh, you want to be a rock star. Like that's awesome. It's more analog. It's right, more right, like right. Yeah, yeah. Like that's what. Oh yeah, he loves the guitar. That's awesome. And he likes to rock climb and he yeah. loves to argue. He loves to argue. Oh yeah, it's any teenager. Loves that to argue. Really, yeah. yeah. So, but I don't. I mean, he's like, why would I want to be a doctor? You guys are so tired. Well, that's also the age, kid. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he hears us. We vent to each other because yeah. we're both doctors. But I do think that if you want to have a life, you can. Mm -hmm. um, and I think things are changing all the time about women in medicine um, and getting the respect that women deserve, mm -hmm. getting the pay that they deserve. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just, I think that it's a, it's a marathon. Yeah. So, you know, as I said before, the first job doesn't have to be your only job. Yeah. Uh, and keep looking for things that meet your, your needs. And there are a lot of people who start clinical and do non-clinical jobs. A lot of people do that. Um, so if you know, after a little while, gosh, seeing patients is not my thing. That's okay. Yeah. You can change. It's Okay. Yeah. You know, you gotta you gotta try to figure out what's gonna make you feel content. I wouldn't say happy. Yeah. But I would say content. Content. Um, yeah. Two questions and then we're and then we're done. Two the first the first question is extremely, extremely important question. What is <laughs> what is the easiest and tastiest pie to make? Oh, okay. So Rose Levy Barenbaum. Rose Levy Barenbaum. Rose Levy Barenbaum, pie and pastry bible. Okay. Her pie crust yes. is the best pie crust. Okay. And what do you do? Do you do, do, you do blueberry? Do you do... At oh, okay. So what is the easiest pie to yeah. make? It tastes good, too. Um, or a starter pie. Uh, I mean, apple's pretty easy. Apple's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, the work is like the peeling yeah. and the, you know, you let it sit and everything. Yeah. But but that's very satisfying. Yeah. And okay. apples are easy. I like apple. Pie. I do make a lemon curd blueberry tart. Mm, wow. That sounds like fancy a though. Short cusp pastry. That sounds really yeah, fancy. Yeah, that's that's more that's more fancy, Advanced. but but that pie and pastry bible it's like it's so good and the crust is super easy. The secret is a little bit of vinegar. Vinegar. Apple cider vinegar. Yeah. Okay, I'm on it. I'm gonna get because I was I I was inspired by um to so think I I watched your YouTube video when you were on the Jefferson and I was like you made five pies a day in residency <laughs> one time how did you do that Oh my god I had a, I didn't even remember I had a video Yeah um yeah when I was applying to med school yeah I I like to cook when I'm yeah stressed out um and I did the whole sourdough thing during yeah. COVID went through like three hundred pounds of flour three hundred pounds Yeah we were buying we were buying. Bags of flour by 50 pounds. Oh my God. And I just kept making bread and making bread and making, I would make eight, I had a starter, I'd feed the starter. I would make eight loaves of bread at a time. Your kid, even a growing 13 year old boy can't eat eight loaves well, of bread. Well, you give it think. away and you freeze it and you, but no, I mean, listen, 
my family could go through a loaf of bread like that in two days. Toast and butter. Toast and butter, true. I've just discovered toast and Nutella. Okay, we're going in a whole different direction. Last question. <laughs> Do you have any closing words in general? And this could be towards people that are interested in hematology, oncology. Um, I don't think we need to talk about people going to the healthcare field because I think that was a great couple of statements you made that I think that'll help a lot of people that I'm going to remember too. Um, so closing statements in general. Again, this could be anything. Maybe about people that are interested in hematology and oncology. Um, well, the first thing is don't forget to breathe. Yeah. It's like... We spent, you know, like, it's just such a stressful time. It really is. And it's all going to be okay. All right. Um, you know, I think what I would say is what I said before, is do a lot of listening. Yeah. And observing of the physicians you work with, you know, the attendings you have. Mm -hmm. Because you can learn the kind of doctor you want to be and the kind of doctor you might not want to be. Yep. Right? So as much as you can, try to observe and listen. It's a learning experience. I'm still learning. You know, I looked up Vismodigib the other day for basal cell carcinoma. I What's mean, it, what are they? Vismodigib, it's a, Vismodigib. It's a hedgehog, sonic hedgehog pathway inhibitor. Oh, God. Yeah, right. So, you know, <laughs> you are going to be learning. Yeah. So I think embracing that and realizing, okay, I'm, I'm learning, I'm going to get there. I'm not going to be perfect at first. That's okay. Be compassionate. Be compassionate. Be compassionate to the patients, to your colleagues, to the family members, the nurses. That is so important because it doesn't take very much to offer compassion, but it means a lot to people who receive it. And it helps you to feel better. Like, you know, if you say to a family member, like, you're doing such a good job taking care of your dad, like, that to them is huge. And then they, they say, oh, thank you. And it just, it, you know, so that's, I think, is a really important thing to remember is to be compassionate and compassionate to yourself if you can. Um, you know, there will be days when you are annoyed with everything. And that's okay, too. But I do think that if you can remember to have compassion, listen and observe, you will, you will emerge less scathed because it is hard. Med school's hard, residency's hard, um, but you can do it. You can do it, you can learn it. it it's okay, you're gonna get through, you're gonna, you're gonna pick a specialty, it's gonna be awesome. You know, <laughs> really, honestly. And, and then, you know, in 20 years, you'll be talk, you know, doing a podcast with someone oh else. Oh, my God. That's crazy. <laughs> well, what a way to end, Amy. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. And I think we're going to help out a lot of people with this. I hope so. so. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That was great. Oh, Thank that you was so super much. Fun. At the end, you were like talking straight to me. I was like, oh, God, you're right. You're just going <laughs> to.